has become known as Black Tuesday. On October 29, 1929, the American stock market crashed and the global economy entered a free fall. Newfoundland and Labrador was hit hard. Its economy centered around exports, the sale of codfish, iron ore, and paper to foreign buyers. But after the stock market crashed, those markets almost disappeared. The timing couldn't have been worse. The Dominion had already suffered 10 years of economic hardship. Part of the problem had been brought on by the First World War. The Dominion's commitment to raise and maintain the Newfoundland Regiment had come at a price tag of about $34 million. To cover those costs, the government had to borrow heavily from lenders in New York and London. The Newfoundland Railway was another serious problem. It was a losing operation for all of the 1920s, with annual deficits that reached as high as $3 million. Making matters even worse, the cod fishery, the very engine of the Newfoundland economy, was struggling. After the First World War ended in 1918, Newfoundland's major rivals returned to the fishery. The markets became quickly glutted with cod and prices fell. By 1922, salt fish was worth less than half what it was in 1918. The government reported a deficit in 1921, followed by 14 more over the next 15 years. It soon had to borrow heavily to provide even the most essential of public services. Unemployment became another problem, and community leaders called upon the government to create jobs. Among them was L.J. Wilson, the parish priest for Trapassi. August 9, 1921 to Prime Minister Sir Richard Squires. Owing to the failure of fishery and lack of other employment, a serious situation faces the people of this parish. Starvation will face our people coming fall and winter, unless House of Assembly will provide $25,000 for necessary works in this section. Things only got worse after the stock market crashed. Global trade contracted, and Newfoundland watched its already tiny income shrink even further. In just three years, the Dominion's export revenues were almost cut in half, but the national debt continued to climb. By the end of 1933, the government owed $100 million to lenders in the United Kingdom and the United States. Interest payments alone ate up 63% of the Dominion's revenues. The effects on families were devastating. Fishers couldn't make a living. Layoffs and pay cuts plagued the mining and forest industries. And the Newfoundland government laid off one-third of its civil servants and cut wages for the rest. The government also slashed spending on health care and education, but in 1932 it doubled the police force to better maintain law and order amid a growing atmosphere of public unrest. The government also introduced new taxes that increased the cost of living by about 30 percent. Poverty and unemployment became quickly widespread. People looked to the government for help, but it had little money to spend on social relief. It distributed rations that became known as the dole. They were worth about six cents a day, and they typically included flour, fat back pork, split peas, cornmeal, molasses, and cocoa. St. John's residents also received vegetables, but people in the outports were expected to grow their own because they had more land. Almost one-third of the population was on the dole in the 1930s. The rations only accounted for about half of a person's nutritional needs, so malnutrition became prevalent and led to several deaths. Infant mortality rates rose, and so did the occurrence of diseases like tuberculosis and beriberi. Unfortunately, medical services were not free in Newfoundland and Labrador, and many people could not afford to visit a doctor. School and rent were other expenses that often went unpaid. A lot of children simply stayed home because their parents couldn't buy them shoes and clothing or pay the school fees. If people did manage to save a small amount of cash for emergencies, then they risked being disqualified from the dole. Government relief officers harshly policed the system. If they learned that an applicant had hunted animals for meat or had some money set aside, then they could reduce or even end dole payments. 
The situation became so desperate in St. John's that the city council started a fundraising campaign in 1932. It asked employees to put away part of their salary for poor relief. On January 5th, Mayor Charles Howlett described some of the city's poor to the local media. He spoke about an unemployed widower named John. After his wife died of malnutrition, John was left alone with six young children. There's only one room for the whole family now. There are two chairs and a broken box. You'll have to stand. One table, a stove lashed together with wire. The snow has melted and dripped through the roof. Two panes of glass are missing and rags stuffed in their place, doing their best to keep out the wind and cold. On a propped up couch, two hollow-eyed, emaciated children are lying. Their legs are naked, their feet the same. The thinnest of torn and worn cotton dresses cover their bodies incompletely. The oldest girl is trying to wash the baby, who has only the clothes of a six-month's baby to cover her. Two small boys are hugging each other in a tumble-down cot in the corner, trying to give and take the heat of their bodies. There's no coal or wood either for two days. What about food? There are a few crusts of bread left by neighbors, not much better off. Similar stories of desperation came from the outports. A relief officer visited St. Lawrence in February of 1932 and reported the following to the Evening Telegram. There were some 30 families who complained that they were without food and that they still had eight days to go before receiving their monthly order, some of them threatening to break in the stores and take food. I called a meeting of the male population and after outlining the condition of the country, and making an appeal to the independent element, whereby I secured some $70 worth of labor for those people that were out of provisions, I managed to fix the matter up satisfactorily. Government officials received countless telegrams and letters from people asking for aid. Community leaders in Upper Island Cove sent the following telegram to the Minister of Justice in December of 1933. People of this place still facing starvation. Great War Veterans Association have done all that lies in their power. Cannot do any more. Have wired all authorities. We now ask you, as head of the law of this country, what can be done and are we allowed to lie down and starve? Please, sir, do your best to help the people to avoid starvation. Please reply. As the Depression deepened, public dissatisfaction grew. Letters appeared in local newspapers asking the government to create jobs or increase the dole. Others said the government was incompetent and should resign. Some people resorted to desperate measures. They raided stores and stole food, clothing, and other goods. Sometimes, peaceful demonstrations turned into riots. This was the case in 1932, when Finance Minister Peter Cashin accused Prime Minister Sir Richard Squires of misusing public funds. On April 5th, a public demonstration outside the Colonial Building escalated into a riot of about 10,000 people. The mob threw stones at windows, raided the building, and looted government offices. Squires escaped unharmed under a police escort, but he was voted out of office in an election two months later. Frederick Alderdice became the new Prime Minister. Under his watch, a royal commission investigated Newfoundland's financial condition. It was headed by Lord Amelry, and he recommended that the Dominion's government be replaced with one made up of appointed commissioners. That happened on February 16, 1934. A British-appointed commission of government assumed power and ended self-government in Newfoundland and Labrador. But life did not become much easier for the working class under the new regime. Dole rations were slightly increased, but they still didn't provide enough food to remain healthy on. On May 10, 1935, the public's discontent once again boiled over into rage. That afternoon, about 500 unemployed people marched to the Colonial Building to demand help from the government. When the police ordered the crowd away from the building's front steps, the peaceful parade quickly escalated into a riot. The police chased the crowd away with batons, but the rioters later broke into some stores downtown and they stole food and shoes. In the end, it was not a new government administration or a change in policy that ended the economic hardships of the 1930s. It was the outbreak of World War II in 1939. The establishment of American and Canadian military bases across Newfoundland and Labrador suddenly created thousands of construction jobs for local workers. 
Enlistment was another source of ready employment. As paying work became plentiful, the number of people receiving the dole plummeted from about 75,000 in 1939 to just 7,000 by the end of 1943. To many people, the war meant an end to the hated dole and a return to self-sufficiency.